Hello, welcome everybody to this latest webinar from Internews' Earth Journalism Network. We're very pleased you can join us today to talk about conservation in the age of COVID and how conservation areas are adjusting to the loss of tourism, which has always been a major revenue earner for many of these uh, vital areas. Um, we are very pleased to have a spectacular group of panelists who will be speaking this today. I'm gonna to introduce them in a moment, but first a few words of introduction about the Earth Journalism Network. Uh, in case you're not familiar with us, we are a global community of over 12,000 journalists from more than 180 countries who are all dedicated to improving coverage of the environment, climate change, health and related issues. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in learning more about us, please check out our website at www.earthjournalism.net. If you're a journalist and you're not a member yet, please do register on the site. Uh, registration is free and we have lots of opportunities available for professional journalists, including story grants, organizational grants, training workshops and the like. Um, and and that's your this is your opportunity to apply for these, and we hope to to work with you and to collaborate with you more in the future. This particular webinar is a part of our project called the Biodiversity Media Initiative. We actually have a, a series of webinars on biodiversity that we're going to be uh, holding over the next three years. So uh, please do check out these in the future as well. Um, we uh, also, again, are offering uh, other opportunities for journalists interested in reporting on biodiversity. With, uh, we have a story grants call that will be open any day now. So if you have ideas for stories that you'd like to find support for, please do feel free to apply uh, and you can learn more about that on our website. But now let's turn to the subject of this webinar. Um, uh, as you're probably aware, many conservation groups are struggling. Uh, they're being forced to adjust to the dramatic decline in tourism during the pandemic, uh, leading to a loss of work, reduced incomes, and in some cases, a return to damaging activities such as illegal poaching. Uh, so how are conservation areas adjusting? What are they doing? This is, we, we wanna get some ideas for solutions here, not just talk about the problems. And so we're very pleased to have with us today a distinguished group of uh, panelists, including Joanna Elliott, who is a senior conservation director at Fauna and Flora International. She's based in the UK. We have Amanda Acosta, the executive director of the Belize Audubon Society. Justine Vaz, the general manager of the Habitat Foundation in Malaysia. And Nela Manjate, the Agricultural Livelihoods Manager at Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. We're, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. So the idea here is the panelists will speak briefly to, to talk about their work. We hope to uh, spend roughly the first half hour of this webinar listen, hearing from them, and then we will open it up for questions from all of you in the audience. We certainly encourage you to uh, ask questions. To do so, you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen that there's a Q&A button. Uh, please use that feature to ask your questions. I realize there's also a chat button, but we do ask that you put your questions in the Q&A. And that way, not only can we try and address them live and we'll, we'll, we'll address the questions to the panelists, but also in some cases, the panelists might even be able to type in answers to some of your questions. So without further ado, we're gonna kick this off. I'm gonna turn it over to Joanna, who is gonna speak about uh, the efforts of Flana and Flora, Fauna and Flora International to address this drastic problem that many conservation areas are facing. Joanna, you wanna take it away, please? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, can you share my presentation, please? Absolutely. Thank you. And maybe flip it straight to the second slide. Uh, just a moment, I'm looking for it here. Uh, 
I have to say, for some reason, I'm not seeing it on my screen. Why don't you start, Joanna? I'll get it up as soon as I can. Okay. Well, it's quite important because it's got a map, you see, and I was going to talk to the map as my second slide. But anyway, um, hi, everyone. Uh, let me just quickly, while we look for the presentation, I'll introduce um, the, the few uh, words I'd like to share with you today. Um, so FFI is a one of uh, the uh, an international conservation organisation, but one of the ones particularly focused on um, working with local partners across the world to uh, to help shape and deliver um, conservation initiatives that work at local level. Thank you. So um, you'll see from this map we work. Uh, we've got more than 140 projects spread across 40 countries. Um, and in each of those places, our mission is to work with local people, local organisations to deliver biodiversity outcomes and habitat outcomes that work um, sustainably for the benefit of local people and for the, um, those natural assets. Um, now, COVID, obviously, as you'll all be aware, has just had this the most dramatic impact on the whole context in which we operate. So, um, essentially, uh, the immediate impacts were, of course, a push into emergency, stay at home, um, health, health concerns and health impacts. Um, but also what we've noted as 2020 has gone on is the, um, the impact on people's sense of um, confidence, sense of resilience, sense of the future. And our responses really are looking at all of those. So, yes, gl the global tourism sector has dropped. Uh, by 80% in value during the year 2020. And we're seeing the huge impacts of that, which I'll talk a bit about. Um, but essentially what we're seeing is a, a, a place in which um, uncertainty and concern about the future is really shaping um, the work that our partner organizations are trying to deliver. So FFI's response in aggregate has been twofold. Firstly, recognizing the immediate emergency we set up a, uh, a partner crisis fund where we have shared emergency support for everything from food aid to keep local community partners going through to um, replacing, uh, income, replacing salaries for some short term positions or emergency supplies to keep uh, project work going. Um, but what we're also doing is providing us a, a long term support. Our ambition is to provide long term uh, support for resilience and sustainable livelihoods building across this network. So if I could have the next slide, please. Just a quick taster of each region. So the biggest impact for us has been Africa. Um, you'll, many of you will be aware of the, the critical importance of nature-based tour tourism in Africa. Um, in 2019, delivering $29 billion of revenue and supporting at least 3.8 million jobs directly. Um, some of the areas we're working in that have been particularly badly affected are particularly in East Africa. So the community conservancy systems across East Africa have seen job losses of up to 50%. Um, we have seen uh, many people put on uh, unpaid leave and we've seen salary cuts across the board again of up to 40-50%. So that's just in, in 2020. Um, Old Pegeta, which is this photo here, is one of Africa's leading conservancies, in fact, one of the world's leading conservancies and a model for the world in how to um, create areas that are self-sustaining financially. This was one of the first ranches to become self-sustaining and supporting lots of neighboring communities with jobs and direct and indirect livelihoods gains. Uh, the impacts here have been um, serious, uh, significant losses. Um, but again, uh, one of, I think something you might all be interested in is the fact that actually the a strategy pursued five years ago by Olpegeta of developing its domestic tourism market has really helped build resilience. So 50% of the visitors to Olpegeta are Kenyans, and that has, independently of lockdown, when lockdown has not been in place, those tourists have been the first to come back. So this has been really significant. Um, I should also say, though, that one of the impacts of COVID and the lockdowns has been people returning to rural areas and therefore an increase in bushmeat poaching. So 
um, things are not in balance and the future is much more precarious now than it was. Next slide, please. And just to contrast um, our work in Central America, for example, yes, in the Caribbean, there's been a significant impact in, of loss of tourism. But what we're seeing in particular is that by losing tourists, you've also lo lost the surveillance systems that were helping just to monitor illegal use or unsustainable use. And actually, we see we are seeing now um, increase in illegal fishing, for example, and activities that are compromising sustainability. Um, we're also seeing in um, Honduras, for example, increased in illegal fishing and in southern Belize, and I know we'll hear more about Belize later, uh, in southern Belize we're seeing um, increase in illegal de in deforestation from people whose livelihoods have been impacted. So the increase in unemployment across all of our partner org organizations' geographies has really had knock-on impacts in the, the dependence that people have had to return to on unsustainable practices. Um, next slide, please. In Southeast Asia, in our programs across that region, we've seen more resilience. This is partly because lockdowns haven't been so severe and partly because the dependence on international tourism for biodiversity funding is much lower. Um, so where the, the places we, the partners we have seen most impacted are those partners who are dependent on donor funds for trying to work with um, local communities and get enable community engagement in management of natural areas. And we have stepped in there. Um, our support fund has so far given $1.2 million uh, in emergency assistance to our partner organizations. Of that 1.2 million, 50% has gone to Africa and the rest has been very broadly geographically spread. Next slide, please. I just wanted to bring your attention to a knock-on impact not many people are articulating as yet, which is the impact on the carbon markets. So in 2018, for the first time, we saw the demand for forest carbon outstrip the supply in the voluntary carbon markets. But of course, the collapse of the tourism industry has led to the collapse of the airline industry and the demand that was coming from um, the airlines for carbon offsets has disappeared. And this, this is also removing, for the moment, a source of a very important source of conservation funding. And of course, next year, 2021, we've got the climate COP and all of the promise of a resurgence in carbon markets. And this is a going to, next year is going to be terribly important for helping shape those markets to make sure they can bring conservation funding through the climate mar markets into uh, local places and the places that have been suffering most from the impacts of COVID. Um, next slide, please. So our focus, in addition to providing this partner emergency fund, we our primary focus with our partner organizations worldwide is on really building resilience. So enabling um, more and more organizations to adopt models like that in Old Pegeta of these diversified revenue streams. So in addition to tourism and in building domestic tourism product in particular, ensuring that people have access to opportunities that might be provided from agriculture, um, agricultural um, shortening supply chains, adding value to local product, uh, enabling access to local markets, but also to international markets with the appropriate premium for safeguarding biodiversity. Um, and one another area here as well would be uh, renewable energies. So there's lots of scope, particularly for um, small scale solar and hydro projects that put energy back into local and national grids and thereby generate income for communities and uh, the areas that they're trying to manage. So this is another area in which we're trying to invest as we pull out of the emergency phase of COVID into the uh, resilience building phase. And the next slide, please. Uh, and this is my final slide. So what brings it all together for FFI is really this focus on uh, local partner resilience building. And one of the things we've done is launched a campaign called Our One Home. Uh, this was launched um, with 
It's a campaign with signatories from 170 partner organizations across the world. Um, this has gone to, uh, it went to, it was published, no, it was launched on the, uh, at the UN Biodiversity Summit at the end of September and is attracting a lot of attention. The main demand is to bring uh, an extra $500 billion a year. So the gap, we're all aware that, uh, that global bodies have confirmed exists in the funding for biodiversity country worldwide, uh, for biodiversity conservation worldwide. We're asking that that extra $500 billion a year now be made real, particularly in the light of the, the CBD promises going forwards from 2021. And that this be, in, in particular, that this funding be brought down to local level. Spending it locally is what counts. This needs to, a, a greater share needs to come through local organizations, community-based initiatives, and initiatives that really make a difference. Um, and we believe that actually this is, you know, people say, where should this funding come from? Well, uh, simply eliminating perverse subsidies alone is, has been uh, worked out by various papers published this year and last year, um, that eliminating just the, the subsidies for fossil fuels would be sufficient to fund this scale of, of activity. So we're, we're, we're ending 2020 with, um, you know, hoping that things will never be this bad again. Uh, also hoping that what we've done is helped bring the world's attention to the role that biodiversity conservation is going to play in, in both ameliorating climate change, helping the world adapt to climate change and reducing the risk of future pandemics but to do so in a way that really honors and recognizes the role of those local organizations at the front line of conservation and the need to ensure that they, that they are uh, fully supported. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanna. Lots of interesting information there. And I see we already have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Please keep them coming. We will get to your questions uh, right after the speakers are finished. But right now we're gonna switch it over to Justine in Malaysia. Justine, please take it away. You're muted, Justine. Okay. All right. Good, uh, good evening, everyone from Malaysia. It's quite late over here, um, and it's been a pleasure to join you. I'm just going to share my screen. We're starting our experience uh, in Asia, I'm told, so I get to go first. All right, uh, is that okay? Everything all right? Please go okay. ahead. Yeah. Yes, all right. So uh, I've, titled, I've titled this presentation Strategies to Survive COVID, but in, in actual fact, we are talking about conservation and tourism in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia and the other parts of Southeast Asia are quite badly affected by the absolute decline in tourism. Uh, and so I come to you from Penang, right? So Penang uh, is, of course, uh, uh, an island on the west part of Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, it's famous as a World Heritage Area. Uh, it's a former British colonial history and uh, the habitat Penang Hill, where we have uh, an ecotourism attraction, is a rainforest discovery park just 20 minutes from, from the city area. Uh, of course, uh, there is a rich history. Uh, the, the hill was often a hill station for people to recover from the vape tropics and the, you know, the pressures of the heat and so on. Uh, it, today, it's a modern uh, train ride up, uh, but it's a really quick way to access a beautiful part of the island. Uh, and you find out that Penang is not just a pearl of the Orient uh, and the culinary capital of the world. It is also an emerald isle. At least a third of this island is covered by its original cover of forest. And so the habitat uh, provides iconic infrastructure that allows people to look into the forest reserves uh, facing the north and northwest parts of the island uh, where there is rich biodiversity. Um, and we use this park uh, as an easy get to know place for people to learn, be educated about rainforest diversity. Um, I think just a minute, I've skipped. Okay. Um, and because the, uh, the high traffic or you know, being a busy port city on the leisure cruise line uh, we are able to previously uh, have over a million riderships up to the hill and um, welcome people to the park, 
uh, what, what the Habitat has sought to do uh, has been to really push the envelope in offering a world-class tourism experience uh, in the expectation that uh, doing tourism well would give us the funds that we need to really set uh, and, and a model of that uh, protected areas can be places to generate sustainable financing, right? And because they've always, in, in this part of the world, uh, protected areas are regarded as a waste of time, right? They are, they are still regarded as, uh, you know, it would be better to develop. And so, you know, we're trying to justify the business model for protection. Uh, so now the unique thing about the Habitat Bana Hill is that the, all of the funds which are generated from the, the ecotourism is channeled into the foundation. So this is where I come in uh, and this is where we are currently. I mean, so the work that we fund uh, deals with conservation education and, uh, and funding uh, ecotourism, um, ecosystem restoration. We also do some species research and so on. Uh, an exciting part of uh, last year was we had we were ready to put in a nomination for a biosphere reserve. So this whole area is also going to be a UNESCO biosphere reserve in time. Okay, so this is this is the part of the story where we all are at where uh, things were going so fantastically and now they aren't. Uh, 2020, uh, ironically, was supposed to be Visit Malaysia Year, right? So uh, here we are. Um, so I think. This part of this, I think, just joining the conversation, uh, what is it meant, has it meant uh, for us? Uh, we have been impacted, of course. The habitat to be at this level has a huge staff. Uh, we've had to diversify, just as uh, Joanna was talking about, right? The whole business of uh, that whole story about not putting all your eggs in one basket. It's been a hard lesson to learn, uh, but we've been adapting. We've been pivoting uh, to, in two ways. Adjusting is one, is diversifying our products, uh, moving into education, uh, and also uh, beginning to really seriously uh, target the domestic market. Uh, previously, we could rely on about 50% foreign tourists. Uh, of course, uh, tourism is the third largest income earner in Malaysia, generating about 86 billion in receipts and 6% uh, of our GDP. So the impacts are huge and wide. All right. The other thing to mention is, of course, tourism is an, has always been for quite a long time uh, a major contributor to conservation, uh, small organizations and so on. So, uh, so at this point, I just want to introduce to you uh, a phrase which uh, came up in Malaysia uh, in response to the COVID adjustment, right? It requires a whole society approach to bring the pandemic under control. And so we, there was this hashtag, Kita Jaga Kita, which is Malay for, uh, we look out for one another, right? And so uh, what we are doing now in the, the work of the foundation is to use that uh, to reach out to Malaysians and say big hearted Malaysians, one of the things that you can do uh, is to basically support domestic tourism. So that's one of the roles that we've given to ourselves uh, in, the, in, in the space. Uh, so one of, one of the first things we've done now, although we've had conservation grants and research grants, we created a sustainable tourism grant. Uh, for the first time, we'll be awarding up to 100,000 ringgit worth of grants for people to build back better, uh, strengthen their capacity and the linkages between tourism and conservation. Uh, that's ongoing. Um, and then this other thing that we thought we could do. So we created something called uh, HEART, which is the Habitat Earth Adventure Responsible Tourism Channel. And this is something most tourism uh, is, is little, are small and they have no marketing budget to speak of. So we are just leveraging off our media and communication savvy to give people a boost uh, to help local, uh, the Malaysian tra traveler to realize that there are lots of places that they can go. Right, and so one of the significant things to really realize is that although we are uh, we are missing the 26 point, 26 point one million people that visited Malaysia last year, uh, there's a whole lot of Malaysians who love travel who can't go anywhere, and uh, we are finding across the board in amongst all the destinations is that people are seeking nature. It's a very natural reaction, and uh, this is we want to try to facilitate that. Okay. Um, 
just briefly to give you, I mean, I think to speak to some of the challenges that small organizations are facing, uh, they have had to adjust to no volunteer money, no research money, no tourism visitor money. And so there's various ways in which they're trying to fill these gaps. One of course is donations. Uh, our Turtle Conservation Society, Tanzani, uh, is asking people to uh, help in that way. Um, and similarly, many others, uh, in Borneo Sun Bear Conservation Center in Sabah uh, has adoption programs. So there's ways that people can help even if they can't travel to Malaysia to help uh, everyone get through this uh, difficult period. Uh, of course, everyone, including ourselves, has to improve their merchandise game, right? So you can get your special printed turtle masks and other similar sorts of things. Um, this is a friend of mine who is in southern Thailand at Khao Sok National Park. Uh, this is talking about, although this business of catering towards the domestic market is uh, one of the things, obvious things we need to do, the reason most people haven't done this uh, much is because the domestic market is not as evolved as the foreign ecotourism market. There is a whole lot of visitor education uh, that needs to happen in order to lessen the mass tourism impact that could, that could uh, unleash itself on beautiful nature destinations like this in Khao Sok National Park. Uh, you know, it's true. I mean, across the board, people have observed that nature has been really bouncing back. You know, you're seeing it all over the place. You know, the not having so many visitors has been great, um, but there still needs to be a hefty amount of uh, building a culture of ecotourism in the domestic market that we have to spend a good deal of time and uh, creativity to nurture. Um, okay, so this is a, uh, just a, a little taste of what else is happening in the world. Uh, this is a friend of mine in uh, Sabah in the central of Borneo. And they're saying, look, this is, we, we now, he now, he now has the run of the place because we are short on tourists, but uh, luckily they're living in pristine natural environments and are able to revert to a long culture of Sweden farming and rice farming and fishing. Uh, having a good quality, pure environment is so essential to be able to weather these storms. Um, but, you know, there's the determination to build back um, and uh, begin to welcome foreign visitors once more. Okay, so that's th that's my presentation for you. So, thank you, Justine. Thank right. you very much. Okay. Uh, we're going to turn it over straight away to Nela Nela in Mozambique. Please, Nela, go ahead. Uh, thank you, James. Can you please share my presentation? Okay. Please start. I'm getting it ready for you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for having me. Today I'll be talking about a little bit of Gorongosa National Park experience um, on the COVID um, impact on the tourism. So we like to call Gorongosa National Park as a park of the people. You can go to the second slide, please, James. Um, a park to the people because um, we say that our vision is to create uh, a world where, where people and the planet can thrive together. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the main concern of the Gorongosa project was basically to recover everything that was lost in the park uh, during the war. Um, and we can say that, that the Gorongosa is a su success story because we managed to, um, to repopulate the park with the different species, species that we, 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 we kind of lost during the war. And in this phase that we are now with the, the help of many donors like USAID, Canada and Norway and, so, and others, we are not only um, looking for the conservation part, but we are also looking at human development that is uh, to guarantee that people living around the park that comprises six districts, they have sustainable um, livelihoods so that we can kind of reduce the pressure on the park's resources. We have to understand that they are native from their, that area, even though it's a reservation area, we, we, these people were born there and they know nothing different that explore those resources to, for, them, for, their, for their livelihoods. So um, please go to the next slide. So what we do in tourism, I like to say that we do transformative tourism and we employ local people to be our guides, to be 
some of them are there uh, doing the master's uh, uh, courses. Some of the uh, uh, guides uh, are working at the, the tourism facilities that we, we, we have there. Um, and uh, obviously, um, we can go to the, slide, the next slide, please. Obviously, with the COVID situation, this kind of uh, affect directly people working in the tourists and also the, the, the revenue, because all the revenue that we do from the tourism activities, they go back to the communities. Uh, and what, what they do with that money is they in, invest it in things that they think that the community needs, like boreholes, like uh, renewing a, a hospital or, or whatever they, they decide as a group, or as the committee, uh, that they need for the community, they uh, they invested my own that. And obviously with the tourism facility closed and all the tourism activities interrupted, this revenue is not going for them because we are not having any revenue. We had um, tourism staff losing their jobs. We have all the stuff that we prepared for the high season last. And I think that these are common experiences to the different um, initiatives and projects that are being um, uh, discussed today but as a way of kind of um, going around this situation is that many or some people from the tourist staff are doing other jobs in other departments from the, the Gorongosa project we have currently around 600 or oh, six departments and we are around 800 people mostly employed from that region. So we have people that were guides that they are now working at the human development department as drivers or the sustainable de development department, department as drivers also or doing any other job that they can do so that they are not just home, not doing anything. They, they kind of um, position in other sectors that we have inside the the machine, the Gorongosa project machine. Uh, we also have shift the, 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 the focus of tourism to trainings. We are training local people in different uh, activities that we are introducing like walk safaris, uh, like um, discovering new, new, new ways or, and, and uh, to, to achieve new places for to include in our uh, tourist packages. We are doing a lot of research and we discovered new interesting places for to include in our packages. So we are kind of focusing on that. And I have to say that we are blessed to have such support from so many donors that allow us to kind of shift even though we are not having the income directly for the, the tourism activity, but we have some kind of pillow so that we can keep doing some other things and not just leave people without jobs. They are doing other things. Can you go to the next slide, please? But I can say that what really, really um, uh, reduces the impact of, of the, 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 the problems in tourism that COVID is bringing is that we do not only rely on the tourism activities to make the community, uh, people from the communities around the park lives better. We also have support, we also support three main value chains uh, that are the coffee value chain, the cashew value chain and honey. I believe some of you already seen that uh, our coffee, Gorongosa coffee in some of your shelves in your countries. Uh, and we kind of created a sustainability system that we have a uh, kind of private company that is the Produce Naturais da Gorongosa that places as the main market for these products that we, we support. So what we do is that we work with the people from the community, normally farmers from the community. We support them with uh, inputs. We support that, them with technical assistance. We support them throughout all the value chain, the production phase of the value chain. And then at the end, we buy the products for them, we add value and then we sell it. The revenue of this uh, company also goes back to the project, to the human development uh, uh, activities. So we not only provide um, uh, services like in education, uh, girls education, we are working to keep girls at school, like uh, health, uh, we give, uh, 
prenatal uh, assistance to people, HIV assistance, and, and all these activities that you provide uh, in communities such as these ones in, in, um, in, um, in health. But we also have a company that makes sure that we kind of try to develop a sustainable system of making income and making revenue. And then this revenue goes back to the project, to the other activities that do not uh, make uh, uh, kind of revenues. So we are currently working with more or less 5,000 5, uh, farmers and around 35 to 40% are women involved in the tree value chains that I just mentioned. Here below in the corner, you can see a, a photo that I have to give credits to myself for such a beautiful picture of women working with clay because they were, uh, we are trying now to create workshops where people from the community will be uh, producing specific products that we will be selling in our uh, tourism shops and if we pro uh, find the right products we can also export them and these products will be produ produced by local people and uh, practices that that they already do but we can just improve them and make them marketable if that word exists can we go to the the, the next slide please I am not there yet, but if I can check on my screen here. So yeah, after this, we have uh, what we call the virtual value chains. That is uh, what I was uh, trying to explain before that we create value chains that we support people from the community that were previously kind of contributing to the forestation to unsustainable uh, exploration of the, the resources that they have. And we train them, we give them technical system, we improve their ways of exploring their own um, resources. And we, we, we kind of installed this, this value chains were not just aleatorily uh, chose, but we wanted to introduce uh, crop, um, cash crops that also would um, contribute to reforestation. That's why we do coffee in the Mount Korongosa that is the main rainforest that we have in the country, uh, in, the, in the region. And uh, cashew that is also contributing to the reforestation in the communities around the park in the buffer zone. So as we have the production naturalized the Gorongosa, we kind of place the final market to them. And then from that, we add value and then we send back the money to the, to the project. Can you please go to the next slide? And here we would like to mention that we believe this is kind of our theory of change that we base our activities on, because we believe that the right mix of strategy interventions that are listed here, we will accelerate a virtuous cycle within agricultural value chains and that that and then that will promote prosperity and envir environmental stewardships. Um, I would go to the next slide. We're going to need you to wrap it up, please, soon, Nela. Okay. Yes, it was my last slide, actually. That was great. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nela. And let's turn it over quickly to Amanda in Belize. So, good morning from Belize. So, I'll just share my screen quickly. Um, There we go. I hope everybody can see my screen. Okay, yep. great. All right, so I am coming from Belize. I'm going to be focusing on Belize and Belizean protected areas. So what I have is basically a general start off. How are protected areas funded? Um, I'll focus a little bit on the region and Belize specifically. So most protected areas in the normal scope of things are actually government funded and it is government institutions that run the protected areas. Um, I will say that government funding traditionally is never enough for all of the needs and demands of the protected areas. So there is always a need for supplemental or additional income. Um, in the case of my neighbors um, surrounding Belize, specifically Mexico and Guatemala, that is the particular case where it is government run institutions and NGOs 
traditionally work with buffer communities and they look at alternative livelihoods and how to develop incomes and economic, economically stable, sustainable situations, resiliency using the natural resources. So how do you fill the gaps that you have when it talks about protected areas? Traditionally, grants and donors is a easy fill um, where you basically are writing projects specifically to fill gaps. Um, they can, they are what we call restricted funds, meaning it is for a very specific, it's a project, it's dictated what's happening, what are the objectives, what are the outcomes. The benefit of where we get into tourism is self-generated funds. Self-generated funds are in essence a bit of the holy grail. You would love self-generated funds because they are unrestricted funds. That basically means if the boat engine dies today and we have to find $2,000 for it to be for parts and to fix it. That generally either, if it's run by a government entity, it goes back to the government. And you'll see right now why self-generated is very interesting for Belize. So in Belize, this is a lovely map of Belize. Belize is very small. It is the second smallest country in Central America. What you see to the east of us is going actually the Caribbean Sea. So we are a mix of Caribbean and Central American in nature. Um, Caribbean in that we speak English, Caribbean in that we are um, very culturally similar um, in many ways, and yet Central American in that we're land bound, we have a lot of the same dynamics. We have um, a large, uh, over the past few decades with the instability in Central America, we have a large um, now growing um, Latino population. Um, of immigrants. And so we have this very broad um, diversity of people. The interesting thing is our population is very small in comparison to most, most Latin countries. It is about 400,000 people within this entire country range. Is about, so it, it's relatively small um, and that will also come up as I go on in my discussion. So Belize Audubon and what makes Belize so different? Um, Belize actually has a system of co-management. Now, co-management is where the government has an actual contract with an entity, um, specifically an NGO or a community-based organization, who actually is tasked with all the day-to-day -day operations of managing a protected area. So Belize Audubon manages seven protected areas on behalf of the people and government of Belize. That means we hire everybody, we have to pay everybody, and we, the only government subsidy we get is through the fees that we collect. We are to report them financially, and we then have to spend, we can then spend them. The country has a total of 103 protected areas. That's all these beautiful colors on my map that you see. And you can see in the legend on the top, we have archeological reserves, bird sanctuaries, forest reserves. So their designation um, actually dictates what you can and cannot do in these protected areas. Um, so for instance, the strictest um, reserve that you can have, which is um, Bladen Natural Reserve. Bladen actually, you cannot, um, you can't do anything in it. Really, it's based for science and complete preservation. So based on your designation, you have options or you don't have options in terms of tourism. Um, I did put here that not all protected areas are created equally in that in some cases, and if you look at my map, some of these protected areas obviously ecologically will be very important, but they are either landlocked or the access points to get to them is very difficult. Um, in the case of Belize, if you look at the west of my map on the west end, the borderline you'll see is where we have our largest track of protected areas. That entire area is in pink and brown is the Maya Mountain Massif. For us Belizeans to get access into this area, it takes about half a day through very, very poor road conditions. On the Guatemalan side, the closest village can walk over the border in five minutes. So it is, uh, we have a lot of transboundary issues um, when it comes to our protected area system. Traditionally, we have, um, like I said, we have looked at options. There is, of this 103 protected areas, we have a National Institute of Archaeology that handles all the archaeological reserves. 
the forest reserves have um, long-term uh, forest concessions, and those are done in, in conjunction with the government and the concessionaire. They have to have 40-year logging plans, and it, the ideal is really looking for sustainable forestry with replanting regimens, and, and the whole property is um, plotted out, and it's a sustainable forestry mechanism. But the idea here is that there's different revenue streams that can be looked at. Some of the revenue streams that we've been looking at that actually have helped us throughout this COVID time and are actually, um, I, I saw that in Africa where we overlap a lot and I think overall with a lot of our presentations, you see some of this overlap. Apiculture is, is a really big one because you are allowed, uh, you, if you have forested area, you actually get really good honey production. And so you have uh, honey, apiculture, we have nurseries, um, the interesting thing about nurseries is you can do them on the edges of forested area. You're looking at natural pollination, natural collection of forested plants, mahoganies, um, different local timber stock, but you also have nurseries. Um, some of the partners and some of the co-managers and small community organizations have also looked into nurseries for fruit bearing. So in this region, citrus is a very large product. And so they have gotten into citrus plants and, and harvesting and selling of these nurseries. It is a high volume. You have to do high volume sales basically for it to be because you're thinking it's, it's not a, a, you're not paying a whole lot for per plant. So you have to do high volume for this to be uh, seriously economically feasible. Um, sorry, I'll go back. I skipped. Other options that we've seen is sustainable forestry. Like I said, depending on the designation of the reserve, you can do forestry. And what we have is a case of many of them are um, registered certified forestry systems. So you have Rainforest Alliance who certifies um, your harvest system. It's, it's very technical in terms of uh, getting out there, marking your trees. You have to have a serious plot. And, and there is a regiment that you have to follow when you are harvesting. There are, um, there is one NGO in particular that runs one of the largest protected areas in the country, and it is a, a income stream, a serious income stream. I will say that the thing with timber is it requires front-ended money, meaning you have to have the money to do all the science, to do the GPSing, to do all the, and then the logging. So when you sell it, you can get, a, it's a high value commodity, and you can actually make it into value added products working with your communities um, doing furniture and, and other items. However, the process of extraction um, is, is front end expensive. The second one that we have here, um, or the fourth that I'm going through in terms of other financing options is actually carbon. And I think Joanna spoke a little bit as to carbon. We are looking at carbon in the voluntary market. So unless you had a locked in agreement, um, it's very difficult to sell carbon at this point. What we are seeing in the marine areas, in order to maintain mangroves, we have a lot of work happening in the area of blue carbon. So we're talking about how you can maintain and look at carbon from, from that end and how you can sell it. However, um, as we're pointing out, there is um, currently, since there is not that much tourism, and we know that the airlines traditionally are the big purchasers um, within the voluntary market, this is, it is a bit, um, it's a bit precarious at this moment in terms of talking about that. So why do I say not all areas are protect, uh, protected areas are created equal? Some have great forest reserves. Some of them have great potential in terms of agro, um, agroforestry products, non-timber products. Um, but some of them, and this is where I work, Half Moon Key, as you can see, this, this island is pretty much set up that you want to go diving here. So that is what its natural talents are. And I know as humans now we talk about what are our natural talents and to follow our passions. So really the island is doing what it's naturally meant to do. It's attracting people to go do these hobbies and passions. So diving is one. Um, what you see behind me currently in my filter and what is here, this is a natural wetland. It is a um, IBA. It is actually an, an a Ramsar site. So there's two or three Ramsar sites with two, two Ramsar sites within the country, and they're important for water birds. And so, um, and across the country, we know that birding has become a big form of tourism. So this is a local women's group that we were training and working with to build their capacity to run um, tours. 
Uh, and so there, it's really bright. I love this picture. And then we have the natural, again, the natural tendencies of, your, of the land. If you can't develop it and you see these great photos and great objects, what do you want to do? Hiking. So where this is an image of Victoria Peak Natural Monument, which is actually adjacent to Coxcomb Basin Wildlife Sanctuary. There is a small season window in which we offer the opportunity to hike here. You have to hire all local tour operators. So the tourism product that is offered locally by your protected area managers, such as the Lee's Audubon Society, is directly tied into the communities and the buffer communities. You have tour operators. They have actual local groups. There is a lady um, who can do your, your natural herbal blessing. Um, there is, for instance, all the small restaurants that are you see on the roadside normally are aligned with the tourism product. Um, there is a gentleman, we talk about coffee and chocolate, um, all of these additional products, but who is the market? When I'm telling you that we have a population of 400,000 people, you have to consider um, Central American countries and the, if you look at the GDPs, the domestic market in terms of supporting the tourism industry is very small. Um, if you consider countries like Honduras, Guatemala, where you have large indigenous populations and you are talking about impoverished regions, um, and now we're talking about Hurricane Ita and Iota, who basically have decimated these areas with flooding beliefs. Currently, half of the country is underwater. Um, so the creating of the resiliency of the communities is important, but you have to realize that if the population and themselves are are not generating that much money. They really can't support the industry um, as, it, as it's related to that. I have this slide here that I'm calling the tourism, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, the, the beauty of tourism is that it brings in foreign exchange. And for the country of Belize, actually, the loss of tourism since March has meant um, not only towards the tourism sector, it was generating 50% of the foreign exchange for the country. So importation of products into the country has become limited. Um, and so that actually has translated into the purchasing power of the country and the people. Um, and so that has a direct impact. Um, the bad, what I call the bad, I haven't reflected here. The bad is that really tourism is, what we are looking for is tourism as a conservation tool. I think we need to make that clear. It's not, to maximize and optimize tourism. The idea is to come up with what I call the sweet spot. You know, the Goldilocks story, it's not too hot, not too cold, it's that perfect mix. Most of us are looking for that perfect stage. We're looking for um, tourists who are coming, who are enjoying the entire experience. You want to experience the local ecotourism. You're contributing back. It's really tourism sustainable tourism. It's tourism that is giving back, feeding back into the community. And it's really looking that your dollars here are coming in. You also have to manage tourism because tourism, there is expectations. There is actually, we have to set up systems in place for tourism. And if you are an NGO such as mine, where we are getting, a, we're really only getting entrance fees from the government, we have to create an income stream for ourselves. Um, we have a very diverse portfolio, but I would not deny the fact that tourism is the largest contributor into our, into our breakdown of how we generate money. Um, it has had a direct impact. The problem is, is the work of protected areas and conservation doesn't go away, even if the tourism does. So we still have to do the po we still have to deal with poachers. So the less jobs people have, the more chances of them poaching. They're clearing land illegally. We've had a lot more wildfires before the rains. Now we were in drought, so um, the drought factor was leading to more wild bush fires. We were contending with fire in the earlier part of the year because people you revert back to what culturally you know, which is farming. Now that we don't have tourism, the tour guides have actually applied for fisheries license. So now we have more people trying to fish and extract from those resources. So it's kind of a case like a stress ball. You squeeze it and it kind of bulges out in different areas. Um, we're seeing the impacts of COVID not only to the direct funding of the protected areas, but you're also seeing it in terms of how it's stressing other areas. Um, I do think that 
that we are in a time where we have to figure out how to diversify and create more resiliency. But I don't deny, and I would never deny the fact that nothing really can compare to tourism. Tourism is actually an advocacy tool as well, because if you consider what you're doing is if you have a great time, you come back and you tell people about it. So you're part of the marketing package. If you have a great time and you're like, oh, I met this man who made chocolate and I had a great experience. I learned um, from basically there's a lot of tours that go from farm to purchasing. So they teach you how to collect your, your, your cacao seeds, the pods and how to grind them and the whole process. That kind of tourism is teaching you about chains, value chains. It's teaching people about where your, your food is coming from. It's really the idea there's a lot of restaurants doing farm to table. So all of that ties into a lot of what we are doing in the NGO sector, promoting conservation. And the more you learn, you become, you start to fall in love with it. You start falling in love with the countries. You start falling in love with the programs. And love is really a passion point. And I always tell people in the NGO sector, we're showing people what your countries have and hoping that they fall in love. Because if you love something, hopefully you take care of it. It becomes this passion point that you can talk very um, eloquently about and you can promote the work. So the idea is that every dollar you spend in tourism does go back into the country, goes back into the production. But the tourists themselves, like I said, become part of the marketing, part of the product. And hopefully donors, volunteers, we've had um, guests who translate into volunteers. So um, the, real, the real idea here is, I think I ended with that slide, but we are um, optimistic. We do think that tourism is not going to go away, but it is the chance to kind of swing the pendulum a little bit and try to make it more uh, promoting the idea of sustainable tourism, the idea of giving back the idea of the fact that tourism is a tool we want to make it very clear that it is a tool that it is not um, it does not dilute the conservation goals it is just a financing mechanism and it is uh it is like thank I you said. amanda yeah yeah so great thank you thanks sorry to interrupt but uh, just no. very mindful that uh we have just a few minutes left before it you know uh and i want to get at least a one question in uh thank you very much to amanda and to all the panelists for a very interesting discussion about the interplay between conservation and tourism. It's, it's quite intriguing to see how, in some ways, the loss of tourism has helped to restore some areas because it's reduced the impact of tourism. But it seems like, of course, that has been counterbalanced by the drastic decline in revenues. So I, perhaps, uh, as now we thank you to uh, folks who have sent in questions on the Q&A feature. Uh, and thanks, and the panelists have been answering many of them uh, online in written fashions, which is great. Um, for the benefit of our video audience that, that the recorded, uh, who are watching the recording, they may not be able to see the written answer. So I do want to ask the panelists uh, at least one question that was posed to us, which is international tourism is good for biodiversity conservation, but bad for climate change. How can international tourists know if they're being, quote, net good or net bad for the environment? Can conservation that depends on international fossil fuel burning flights ever be truly sustainable? And I think a related question, which uh, Joanna slightly, somewhat referred to, was, you know, to what extent do the carbon markets, uh, you said they're becoming an important support mechanism for conservation. How much do they support? Is there some way we can put a, a percentage number on it as, as opposed to other kinds of income streams? I, Joanna, I wonder if you might begin by answering this and we can also canvas the other panels. Okay, so really absolutely critically important question, James. And I've tried answering a little, your first, the first part of your question a bit in the text. So just to summarize again, um, uh, we need international tourists and conservation. I don't think you know, obviously every flight creates carbon emissions, so there's a trade-off the moment you start taking off the ground. But I, what I'm hoping is that 2020 shows us that, you know, some flying is okay, and that actually perhaps some of the international tourism flying is of much greater value than it is cost, particularly if the carbon is offset. And that actually, you know, I would love to see the business sector targeted a little more strongly for 
flight flight emission reductions because I think what 2020 has taught us is we really don't need to be doing all this flying for business. You know, we have plenty of technology alternatives now for meetings and so on. Um, so that's, and, uh, but it, I think you raise a very important question about the carbon markets. I mean, the answer is the voluntary markets at the moment are, they've been very disappointing over the last 10 years in terms of volume and price for what they offer for conservation sector. Um, but look, going forwards, my bigger concern, and I think it should be a concern for all of us, is that with all the companies now announcing their pathways to net zero, um, you know, a lot of that has to come from reduction in fossil fuel emissions. So what we don't want is a, set, is a system of offsets that replaces the need for fossil fuel reductions. So what we want is to encourage both. We need a, we need a really good, compliant, well-regulated system that comes out of next year and Article 6 of the Paris Agreement that gives us a framework for <clears throat> achieving net zero through fossil fuel reductions and at the same time that encourages these natural climate solutions or nature-based adaptations that does bring carbon funding into conservation. Frankly, I don't think it will ever fund more than a fifth of what we need to do for nature. And that funding has got to come from a lot of other places. And frankly, a lot of it is not economically fundable. You know, it's not going to give us the, the, the financial returns that are needed. There's a lot of private capital at the moment seeking a financial return in conservation. Yes, there are some places where there will be a financial return. The timber opportunity in Belize is a good example. You know, there are the cocoa, the commodities, there's plenty of them. But actually what we need to be doing is really valuing nature and the full function it plays for us, which is um, well beyond what the pure markets will be able to articulate. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there for my fellow panelists to add to. <laughs> Would anyone else like to address this question about balancing the good and bad of tourism and especially in relation to carbon markets? I think um, I'll speak a little local to, the, to, to what Joanna is saying. I do think that there is an international conversation and the policy decisions that have to be had. But I think as a local, what we've really done at the grassroots level is try to, to really emphasize the importance of your personal responsibility. If you know that you live a responsible life and that you're purchasing products that are being produced sustainably, that are being done in a holistic way that is sustainable for the environment, I think you can afford to make the decision that I'm going to fly. And for instance, I can decide I'm going to use Delta because Delta purchases um, carbon credits in Belize, then that is a decision. But I do think I agree. A lot of the other, and part of it, like I said, is the experience that you're having. And I think um, one thing COVID has really taught us is the value of, of, of time and your value, what how you value your time um, that you spend, right? The quality, quality of, of what we get to do. Um, because we're so limited in mobility, we really try to look for quality in terms of I, I don't want to spend my time on a flight to the United States where I'm just going to go to a meeting locked up in a conference room using a big AC. I can be in my office having this meeting equally as effectively, but nothing can compare to the experience of going to um, Mozambique and having that experience and, and actually contributing back, buying back, buying the, the products that are locally made there. So, I do think that, that there is the national, international level, but I think locally you can also be responsible in your decisions and choices. Great, thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to respond to this, but we do have another question that some of you may wanna address. What do tangible solutions look like right now to rebuild people's sense of resilience or confidence? Obviously funding can sometimes be very important, but are there other ways to rebuild that sense of security, stability, and hope for the future that COVID has taken away? I can, I can start. Again, my answers are going to be more grassroots, but <laughs> I think what we've done is um, when we talk to our buffer communities and the protect um, that surround the protected areas we work in, we, we talk about 
um, supplemental income. We talk about alternative sources. So a fisherman will always be a fisherman. He will always have a calling for the sea. He will always fish, no matter you, you no matter what you do. What you have to do is you have to create a supplemental source of income that can create the resiliency because climate change is a huge factor when we start talking about the fisheries industry and the terrestrial. So in light of climate change, not only COVID, you have to have various sources of income. The traditional family structure, for instance, where, where it's um, the male, the male is the, the main um, financial earner in the family. You're, you're slowly seeing that change because it's a matter of what can the female or, or how can the wife contribute to the family and the income. And we have found that in many cases, um, the wife traditionally has always been the money manager in the home. It just, just hasn't been recognized as, a, as an important role that she plays. So I think the idea of, of the resiliency that you can create is by, with all of us, right? We have, we have, an, we have a house. Right now, if your income is cut, you look at, can I bake? Can I sell? Can I, can I make, do I have a set, additional skill set? So I think that, that creating income is really, um, and a sense of purpose is really what people are looking for. And I think if you can have various sources, then, then the better you are off. Go ahead, John. Quick addition for me, which I think in addition to that, and, and in addition to the points about taking action, which is terribly, action is very empowering. The moment you take action, you feel more hopeful because you're doing something towards things. But I do think there is a really strong narrative to be told around restoration and the speed with which restoration happens. So we've done a lot of work, for example, on islands in the Caribbean, removing invasive species. If you want a, a hopeful story, that is a really great place to start because what you've got, you go, there's a big bare rock, no seabirds, nothing, everything's been denuded by rats and goats. You spend a year removing rats and goats and leave this big bare rock in the ocean and you think, well, you know, I'll come back in a generation's time and maybe there'll be a couple of trees growing. No. One year later, you know, grass up to here, seeds that have been dormant in the soil for decades are starting to sprout. You know, two years later, you've got a green rock with full of seabird colonies and indigenous lizards and all sorts of things. It's, that's, there's something very empowering about knowing that nature is just waiting to bounce back. So that's where I draw hope from. Thank you, Joanna. Yes, I've also seen how quickly tropical ecosystems in particular can rebound. They're so productive. We're, I'm, I'm mindful we're well past the hour mark, so want to wrap things up, but any final comments, especially Justine, Nela, if you have anything you'd like to add before we, we sign uh, off? I just wanted to add a little bit about the last question. I'll be very quick. I can only speak about my own experience in my country and uh, the region where we work because it is a developing country and uh, we work in the central area of Mozambique, that is uh, Sofala province, that is the main affected with everything that you can think about. It's a conflict area. It has been the stronghold for like the different parties and uh, it's very recurrent um, situations of insecurity. Uh, in 2019, I guess you, ha you, you followed, we had the, the, the Idai uh, cyclone and then you have people like, kind of yearly experiencing any, some type of shock. So I think resilience is something that they may not know the word, but it's, it's natural to them. If you live there, you have to be resilient because you have to overcome daily struggles and shocks, strong shocks that are out of, out of your control. Uh, and I would like to say that also uh, poverty in the rural area and poverty in the urban area are very different things. People from the rural area, they can be poor because they don't have money to buy things, but if they're not lazy, they might always have something to eat if the area have some conditions, like they will grow uh, something that our, our, our struggle right now is to make them grow those things sustainably that they are not damaging the soil, the environment around. So I think that 
one thing that uh, I think Amanda mentioned is the diversity uh, forms of income, because if you have a shock that affects one form specifically, you always might have something else to kind of give you a pillow to keep going. But I'll just stop right there because I know that we ha don't have much time and we can stay here talking forever. Thank you. Thank you, Nela. Justine, any final words? Um, okay, uh, well, I, I, think, uh, I think I like what Joanna said about restoration and certainly as a fund manager, that's where we're putting our efforts. And in actual fact, uh, many uh, groups that have been involved in restoration, I'm thinking of friends in the Kinabatangan floodplain in Sabah, for example, uh, they, they have pioneered riverine forest restoration and have always banked on tourism to provide some of their basic expenses. Now, uh, we are in a position to just uh, pause tourism and focus on restoration. Uh, in other ways, we are also ourselves also retooling and refitting ourselves to become back better. Uh, Malaysia is managing the crisis quite well. We do expect to see periods where things are relatively normal and uh, we think we just to continue to talk about doing ecotourism better, uh, getting local participation, access and benefit sharing, and just keep those things on the agenda. That's what we're trying to do at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Justine. Thanks again to all our panelists. I'll just mention there's been some requests for copies of your presentations. Um, panelists, if you are willing to be contacted by email, can you please quickly put your email address in the chat or someone's email address that uh, that attendees can contact if they want your presentation, please. Um, I think we're going to wrap things up. We're, we're, we're 10 minutes past the hour mark. I just want to, and I thank you again to uh, not just our panelists, but everyone in attendance. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Uh, there are some good ones out there, and it, there are some that are being answered online, so check those out. I will uh, wrap things up with uh, a comment in our chat that I thought was quite profound. This is a comment from Huma Beg in, in Pakistan. Thank you, Huma, for, for joining us. Uh, she says that conservation and tourism are both, or at least tourism when it's done properly, conservation and tourism are both about love, love for nature. And I think that's, uh, that in, in the best of circumstances, that really is true. And, uh, you know, I know we're all out there struggling to find ways to keep our our natural areas beautiful, our beautiful areas uh, intact uh, and, and, and our ecosystems uh, functioning. And, uh, and, and I do know tourism has an important role to play in that. Um, so thank you again to all our panelists for your presentations and your comments and questions. I, I hope this is the start of a broader discussion and to everyone, all the journalists in attendance, uh, we really appreciate your Appreciate your interest in this topic. Uh, please, if you write any stories based on this webinar, can you please send them to us at the Earth Journalism Network? We will be in touch with you, to everyone who is registered, uh, asking for your feedback and for any stories that you may have produced. We're really interested to see what comes out of this. And again, please check out our website, earthjournalism.net, for future webinars on this and many other topics related to environment climate change. Thanks again, everyone. Bye Thank for you. now. Yeah.